Lesson number five today is called Real Missions, Real Missions, and we've been studying over the last, I guess, this is our fifth lesson, obviously, right? And uh, we've been looking at some things that God's Word teaches us about what a real church should be like. There's lots of places that call themselves churches, but, but are they a real church? Do they meet the biblical definition of a real church? And are they doing the things that, that Jesus Christ uh, uh, taught and that the apostles taught for what a church ought to be like a local New Testament uh, church? And so our text verses for today, Acts chapter 13 and verses 1 through 4, the Bible says, Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simeon, that was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Menaean, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed, they, uh, sorry, and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So they being sent forth by the Holy Ghost departed unto Seleucia, and from thence uh, they sailed to uh, Cyprus. Uh, thence and hence, if you ever wonder about those words, thence is the place, that, place where they're going, to there, and, and hence is here. Hence is here. And uh, when we say henceforth, sometimes we mean from here on forward. And thence was the place where they were going, in case those words confuse you just a little bit. Let's have a word of prayer and we'll jump into the lesson. I'm sure glad that you're here uh, this morning. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day. I ask you to speak to us from your word. Teach us uh, what a biblical New Testament church ought to be about. And help us to understand this very important purpose of the church in uh, we're to reach the world with the gospel. We're to be a church that's involved in missions and uh, sending people forth locally, but even sending people around the world uh, to evangelize the world, to give people the wonderful gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Pray this in your precious name. Amen. When Jesus Christ ascended to heaven after his crucifixion and burial and resurrection and so on, when he ascended to heaven, he left the church with a big job to do. A big job, but not an impossible job. And that job is the Great Commission. Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20, tell us this. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. When we consider the, the, the size of the world, the size of the world's population, we may think, oh boy, that's, that's an impossible job. It's not impossible. Big job, yes, but not an impossible job. The population of the world is now somewhere over, I think it's already over 8 billion people, maybe 8.5 billion people. I don't know, it grows so quickly. Um, there's, uh, there's, I think there's twice as many people being born every day as what are dying. And so that's why the world's population is growing so quickly, especially in some countries of the world. God's word is very clear to us that salvation is for the whole world. Salvation is to be spread to the ends of the earth. And uh, the gospel being spread and, and the world hearing of God's wonderful salvation, that's the very heartbeat of God. He wants people to know about his love and his salvation. The Bible tells us in Luke 19, 10, for the son of man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. And it was referring to Jesus Christ when he left heaven and came into this world. His purpose for coming was to seek and to save the lost. It was so that they could be saved from their sins and have the gift of eternal life. In 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9, it says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise. Meaning he's, he's not going to fail to keep his promise. He's, he's not a slacker. He's not lazy. He's not negligent when it comes to him keeping his promise. So the Lord is not slack concerning his uh, promises. Some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come uh, to repentance. God's desire is for the world to be saved. John chapter three, verse 16 says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. 
And God desires for every person, every soul, every man, woman, boy, and girl to know the Lord Jesus Christ in their life as their personal Savior. Not only does Jesus Christ care that the entire world hear the gospel message, but he has, he's commissioned us. Those who are believers, he's commissioned the local church that we're to carry the gospel to every person. In John 20, 21, it says, Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father has sent me, even so send I you. Well, for what purpose did the Father send Jesus? He sent Jesus into the world to bring the lost to salvation, to bring the lost so that they could pass from death unto life. Know the water of life and drink of him, Jesus Christ, who is the water of life, who gives eternal life, and, and so on. And he wants us to share with others the gospel, to bring to others the truth and the gospel message and so on. Billions of people in our generation have not yet heard the gospel. And how are we to reach them? Well, we could, we could think about maybe try to find what are some different techniques, you know, what's some different technology we could use to get the gospel to the masses of people. But it's not about the technology. God can use the technology, right? God could use radio stations and, and nowadays internet radio stations and all kinds of things. He could use many different means and technology that the church could use and believers could use to help spread the gospel to the masses of people around the world. But the bottom line is not, it's not about technology and fancy ideas. It's about the church. It's about God using the church and God using his people to evangelize the whole wide world. Long before modern technology was available, churches of the first century were successfully filling, fulfilling their mission. They were turning the world upside down, the book of Acts says, with the gospel. They were taking the gospel that time to the known world and, and just telling everybody they could about Jesus Christ. And that provides for us a biblical pattern for what missions is all about. Acts chapter 13 records for us the first missionaries that were commissioned and sent. And through these verses we learn what is God's program, what is God's plan for world missions. Especially we want to learn today how every member of a local church can have a part in missions. So number one in your notes, write this, the context of missions. So number one today is the context of missions. In other words, where does missions begin? How is missions done? Who is to be involved in missions? God has designed that real missions takes place through real local New Testament churches. Real missions is to be one of the primary focuses of every biblical church. Letter A in our notes, we'll write that, a local church. The context of missions, where, where does it happen? It's, it, it's supposed to happen through the church, through the church, God using his people. Acts chapter 13 immediately sets for us the context of missions. It begins in the local church. Acts chapter 13 and verse number 1 said, Now there were in the church that was at Antioch. And he's writing to us about what specifically took place at this church in Antioch. That place where, dis where, where disciples were first called Christians and so on. The followers of Jesus. It was in a church, a, a church setting that missions began. As we've studied before, I want you to remember that a church is a called out assembly, born again, baptized believers belonging to the Lord. It's a group of people that have been summoned together and called together uh, and are to rally together around a common bond, a common purpose, a common faith. And the purpose of the local New Testament church is to evangelize the world. The church at Antioch had a unique start in that it was established by believers who had scattered from the church. Uh, they, they'd scattered from Jerusalem because of the great persecution there. At first, though, the believers were in Jerusalem, but they scattered. They went everywhere. And everywhere they went, they started telling people about Jesus. And as they did so, churches were formed. Churches began. And one of those places was in Antioch. And Antioch was a strong, uh, strong church here in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 7 records the powerful message that, that Stephen preached to some unbelieving Jews in Jerusalem. And their hatred towards Jesus Christ was so great that they stoned Stephen. They put Stephen to death. They stoned him. They killed him. 
And so what happened as a result of all this persecution was that Christians started fleeing to other cities and other regions. In Acts chapter 11 and verse 19, it says, Now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen traveled as far as Phenis and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word uh, to none but unto the Jews only. Their first concern was the Jews, because many of them were Jewish themselves. And they were, they were preaching to the Jews and trying to bring them to Jesus Christ and get them to see he's the Messiah, he's the Savior. And as the church at Antioch was growing, something happened that the Christians in Jerusalem really weren't expecting. Not only were many of the Jews trusting Jesus Christ as the Messiah, but Gentiles were turning to the Lord Jesus Christ as well. They were also becoming believers in the Messiah. The church at Jerusalem being comprised uh, primarily of Jewish believers, they were a little bit suspicious about this. Jews and Gentiles together, worshiping and serving the Lord and so on. Maybe they were a little bit prejudiced as well, because many times there's this mentality, it's, it's ours and it's, 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 it's our faith and so on. To settle some concerns, they ended up sending Barnabas to investigate the reports of this, this church at Antioch and boy, all that's going on and people getting saved and Jews and Gentiles together and so on. In Acts chapter 11, 22 and 23, it says, Then tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church, which was, which was at Jerusalem. They started hearing about what was going on. So it says, And they sent forth Barnabas, that he should go as far as Antioch, who when he came and had seen the grace of God, was glad and exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. Barnabas comes to Antioch and he finds here a church that's doing well. He finds here believers that are, have been baptized and they're growing in the Lord and God is really doing something there in Antioch and all that Barnabas can do is, is get up and say keep on cleaving to the Lord. Keep on holding to the Lord. Uh, uh, keep on serving the Lord. And he encouraged them to keep on going. And it was going to be from this church in Antioch that the Holy Spirit of God would, go, would begin working in the hearts of people in that church. There was faithful people in that church and faithful men in that church. And they were already busy serving God. And the Spirit of God would begin stirring them up and working because he wanted to use them to take the gospel further. We saw letter A that, that real missions begins in and through a local church. That was letter A. Real missions begins in and through a local church, letter A. Letter B is this, a loving church. A loving church. Okay, it's going to begin in a local church, a New Testament church, a Bible-believing church. But letter B, it's going to be a loving church. A loving church. Throughout the book of Acts, the presence of the Holy Spirit was evidenced by the people's love for the Lord and also their love for the brethren, their love for one another. We see the bond of love from the, from the very beginning of the early church. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 46, it says, And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. Here at the church in Antioch, we see there was, a, there was this great diversity of backgrounds. You know, it could have been a lot like we, we would see here, where there's people from many different backgrounds, different ethnic backgrounds, different, uh, all kinds of different things different nationalities, and yet they had a common bond, a common uh, love one for another. And thank God we have that here as well. In Acts chapter 13 and verse 1, it says, Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger and Lucius of Cyrene and Menaean, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. It, it was a very diverse church. It was a very international church. Barnabas was a Levite, a native of Cyprus. Uh, Simeon was called Niger, and uh, evidently a, a black man. Latin, in Latin, that word means black. And he was a teacher in the church. Lucius of Cyrene was from a city in, the, in northern Africa on the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, Menion, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, was a man with a strong Roman influence uh, in his life. He had either been raised and educated in the household of Herod, Herod, or he was a companion of Herod. Saul was somebody we know who had a, had a Jewish background, right? He, he was the one who was, uh, had been the great persecutor of the church. In his zeal for God, he persecuted the church and the believers because he thought, why are these people turning to Christ? And he didn't get it until he got converted, right? Until he got saved. 
So there was a great diversity. And uh, even just, just looking at it quickly, there was all these different teachers and people that, that point to diversity of cultures and different backgrounds and so on. But they had something in common. They were all bound together with their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And they were bound together in their, their, their passionately loving the Lord and now loving each other uh, and, and serving each other. The church at Antioch evidenced the love and character of Christ that it was in this place that the name Christian ended up being given first to the believers. Acts chapter 11 and verse 26, it says, And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch, and it came to pass that a whole year, that a whole year, for a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people, and the disciples were called Christians first uh, in Antioch. You know, even that title or that term Christians, it, it wasn't given to them by themselves. It was given to them by the non-believers. And Christians meaning, you know, Christ-like and, 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 you know, Christ followers and so on. Christ-like, little, little, little Christ. It's really what it means, little Christ and Christ-like ones and so on. And the people around them looked at this group of disciples, looked at this group of believers and said, they're little Christ. They're, they're Christ-like ones. And that's where the term Christians came from. And they probably even meant it to be more of a derogatory term. Oh, they're little Christ. They're, they're Christ ones. They're trying to make fun of them. But of course, we, we welcome that name with gladness today. There's nothing wrong or shameful about being Christ-like ones. But here they were, these group of people that so much were living like Jesus Christ and loving one another, welcoming in new converts, whether they were Jews or Gentiles, it did not matter. They were preaching the gospel, they were reaching out to others, and the world couldn't help but see that these people were like Christ. And so they called them Christians. A church without the love of Christ for each other and a church without a love for the lost will never experience real missions the way that God intended. Real missions takes place in a local church that has a loving heart. You've got to love people if you're going to care enough about people to try to give them the gospel. Right? You, you've got to love people if you're going to care enough about your neighbor to try to give them the gospel. You've got to have a love for the lost and a love for people and a love for the world if you're going to give some money to send a missionary to some other country to tell people about Jesus that you've never met before in your life. Right? You've got to have a heart of love. And so we see that real missions takes place in a local church, and it takes place in a loving church. A loving church. This is going to be the kind of church that is ready to see God use them in missions. A church where there's not prejudice, a church where there's a love for all people, and a desire to get the gospel uh, to all people. Number two in your notes there, you can write the calling of the missionaries. The next thing we want to see in our lesson today is the calling of the missionaries. Missions begins in local churches that, that, that are practicing Christ's love. But how is it that some people are called to go to the mission field? Why is it that God could reach down and the Holy Spirit of God could bring a, des a desire and a, and a conviction and put a calling on somebody's life that they know it and, and others know it? That they're called to the mission field. What does it mean? In Acts chapter 13, verse 2 here, we find the first missionary call of the New Testament. It says in verse 2 there, As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit of God, said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. From this verse, we learn two significant things that allow a church family and individuals to, to hear when God is trying to direct someone, when God is trying to call someone to, to missions. Uh, letter A in your notes, write this, in a sanctified time. It will be in a sanctified time that God will call someone to the work of missions. It'll be in a sanctified time that God will call someone to the work of missions. Notice that when the Holy Spirit of God called Barnabas and Saul, the church was already gathering together and ministering to the Lord. They were already fervent in their worship of the Lord. They were already busy serving the Lord. It wasn't a church going through the motions. 
It wasn't a church playing a game. It was a church that was serious about serving the Lord. They were genuinely ministering to the Lord. As they prayed, as they fasted, as they preached, as they were witnessing to others and leading other souls to Christ there in Antioch, as they were singing, as they were giving, as they were serving the Lord, God's Holy Spirit of God brought a calling to these two men. And even made it clear to the church, I want you to separate these two men. Because I've called them for a special calling. I want to use them in another way. You know how we long in our hearts to see God use our church in a similar way. The modern self-centered church sees few people called to missions because they're not ministering to the Lord already. Too often the attitude of Christians in the church is more, what's in it for me, rather than how can I serve Him? Boy, it's a wrong attitude when our mentality is, is what can the church do for me? What's somebody going to do for me rather than how can I serve the Lord? How can I serve my Savior? When your worship and service revolves around uh, simply your own personal uh, gratification or enjoyment, you will miss the joy of ministering to the Lord and serving the Lord. Uh, it may be our tendency at times to think of a calling to missions as something that could only come to a few intensely spiritual and especially dedicated Christians. Yet the church from which the Holy Spirit chooses to call missionaries was filled, filled with Christians who were sanctified to the Lord. A church filled with people that were ministering unto the Lord. It wasn't just a select two, a few. It was a whole church full, filled with people ministering to the Lord and serving the Lord and consecrated to the Lord and so on. And all of us need to be dedicated to the Lord and doing His work. At Antioch, it wasn't just these two men who were called that were sanctified. There was an entire congregation of people filled with people sanctified unto the Lord, dedicated to the Lord. They were serving God. They were praying together. They were seeking the mind of God. The Lord calls those who are already dedicated to Him and serving Him uh, to do His work. You know, when it comes to parents and a home and a family, uh, many times parents may have some household chores for their kids to do. And maybe if you don't yet, I think it's a good idea. I think it's good for you to teach your children to do some chores. They can help you clean the bathroom. They can help you vacuum the floor or sweep the floor. It doesn't all have to be done by mom the maid or, or hired out uh, Molly maid. Like, like children can learn to work and do chores and they can learn to, to make their bed and clean their room and do some things and so on. But as a parent, you only have get, get to assign chores to your own kids that live in your home, right? I don't get to assign chores to the kids that live down the street from me. I only, I only get to assign chores to my children that live, in, that live in my home. As a parent, you have that right. You know, in a similar way, the Holy Spirit of God, He, he doesn't call the world to do His work. When God calls people or gives somebody a, a, a chore to do, a job to do, it's going to be from God's children. It's going to be one of God's children. Not only that, it's going to be those that are sanctified and set apart and with a desire in their heart to serve the Lord. And God doesn't expect those who don't know Him to serve Him. He doesn't expect those who, who, who don't love Him to, to be serving Him in missions. He's looking for those that love Him. He's looking for those that know Him. He's seeking to call some of His own children to serve Him. And we need to be listening to God's voice and responsive to Him and attentive to what the Lord wants us to do. Do. To hear God's call in relation to the mission field, we must already have a heart for the will of God. We must care and desire that I want the mind of Christ and I want to have the love of God for other people. I want to listen to the things that God has for me. We must love who God loves. We must care for who, those whom God cares about. And then God can work in us and use us. We said letter A that the calling of the first missionaries, it came in a sanctified time, sanctified time to people with sanctified hearts, letter B in your notes, write this, it came in a sacrificial time, in a sacrificial time. So under the second point of our outline there, the calling of the missionaries, letter A was a sanctified time, and I would even say also people with sanctified hearts, right? 
But letter B is a sacrificial time. It came in a sacrificial time. As the church at Antioch here was very fervent in their worship and serving the Lord, the Holy Spirit of God called them to, and it's really not a sacrifice, but it fits the outline, right? He called them to sacrifice or to give up two of their very best men to go as missionaries to serve the Lord in another place. And it's, it's really not sacrifice, but sometimes we look at it that way when we shouldn't. Missionary Adam Adam Judson wrote this, the motto of every missionary, whether a preacher or a printer of God's word or a schoolmaster, you know, Christian school, ought to be a motto of devoted for life. Devoted for life. This is the motto that every Christian in every local church should have, that we have committed our lives to the Lord Jesus Christ. And we'd be willing to go or we'd be willing to stay and send others if that's what God bids us to do. That if God was to come to some in our church and bid them to go, they'd be willing to go. If God comes to you and he's bidding you to stay and help send them, then that's what you'll do. That we just do what God wants us to do. The need of souls to hear the gospel and the commission that Christ has given to the local New Testament church is worthy of our highest sacrifices. Charles Spurgeon said this, if there be any one point in which the Christian church ought to, ought to keep its fervor at a very hot white heat, uh, it is concerning missions. If there be anything about which we cannot tolerate lukewarmness, it is the matter of sending the gospel to the dying world. Uh, Charles Spurgeon said, we ought to be white hot. And you might might say red hot, white hot, whatever you want to say. I know that with my, my dad on the farm and he, his, um, you know, the, the torches that he had and welding machines, he had welding machines and torches and so on. When the torches actually were at their most intense heat, it was, it was a blue, a blue flame, right? I don't care how you say it, whether you want to call it blue hot, red hot, white hot, whatever. We ought to be hot for the things that God is concerned about, that God loves. And we ought to have a passion for wanting to get the gospel to the world. You say, preacher, why have we had so many missionaries to our church this year? Because I want you to get a passion uh, for the world and for world missions and getting the gospel to the world. Because that's what our church is to be about. That's the thing that our church is supposed to be the hottest about and the most concerned about is getting the gospel out to our city and getting the gospel out to our world. It's more important than any other, uh, you know, uh, gatherings or just activities. Uh, Us praying and serving the Lord and uh, getting the gospel to the world is what God desires greatly from our church. The church at Antioch was committed. They were not only praying, they were fasting as well. And it requires sacrifice to spend time in prayer and fasting. Fasting is a way to bring prayer to its fullest potential. Spending serious time in prayer and fasting is a physical indication of a heart that yearns for God's will and for God's answers more than for our physical appetites to be fulfilled. This was a church that was fully devoted to the Lord. Sacrifice is not just for a few special Christians. Jesus Christ is calling every Christian to sacrifice. Every Christian ought to sacrifice. Matthew 10, 37 and 38 says, He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. And Jesus was simply saying, There should be no love in your life than that is greater than your love for the Savior. No no love in your life than that is greater than your love for the Lord Jesus Christ. And we should be willing to take up any cross that we must bear and follow after him. Real missions involves a sacrifice of heart that makes every other earthly love pale in comparison to our love for Jesus Christ. This means that whether we're called to go to the foreign mission field ourselves or whether we're called to send others or send our children, that we would be willing to sacrifice in prayer and fasting and giving to further the work of the Lord and say, God, if it's your will for them to go, I will send them. God, if it's your will for me to go, I will go, Lord. I'll do whatever you ask me to do. We're called to missions. All of us are, but it's either to go or to send. To go or to send. William Carey was one of the early missionaries of the the modern era. Many people refer to, to William Carey as the father of modern missions. William Carey was somebody who who worked on shoes, fixing shoes. But he sensed God's calling on his life to go to India in the late 1700s. 
He would end up spending 42 years in India leading converts to Christ and planning churches and translating the Bible into many languages. It was a very slow work. It was a very hard work. And sometimes it even appeared that they wasn't seeing much fruit from that work. But in the end, William Carey's lifetime of work yielded great fruit. Once when asked what was the secret to his success, he, he, he gave the credit to his crippled sister that had to stay in a bed. She was bedridden in England, but she prayed for him faithfully. He says that he, he wrote her every day. He would write her a letter every day and send that to her. And when she would get those letters in the mail, she would know, read it and know all that was going on in his life and ministry and pray specifically for her brother and his burdens and the needs of the work in the ministry in India. Although she herself was unable to serve on the foreign mission field, William Carey's sister faithfully interceded for him in prayer and for the work. And her sacrificial labor in prayer was the unseen lifeline to William Carey's work there in India. Andrew Murray said, There is a need of a great revival of spiritual life, of truly fervent devotion to our Lord Jesus Christ, of entire consecration to His service. It is only in a church in which this spirit of revival has at least begun that there's any hope of radical change in the relation of the majority of our Christian people to mission work. Real missions happens when there is a local church that is filled with people who have sanctified themselves to the Lord and who are willing to sacrifice what they have so that others can hear the gospel. It's going to be in that kind of environment, spiritual environment, dedicated environment, that the church will be listening to the Spirit of God's directing and leading and, and a church will be sensitive to doing what the Lord wants them to do. We need sanctified hearts. We need sacrificial hearts. Hearts that God is speaking to and we're listening. Uh, letter C in your notes write this, in a speaking time. In a speaking time. To this church that was ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Ghost said to them, Separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. You know, men can speak sometimes, but how much greater when God speaks? When God is speaking to hearts and people are listening. You know, what men say may be open for debate at times, but when the Holy Spirit of God speaks to us, there's no debating it. You can't argue with it. The Holy Spirit of God speaks to you, you, should, you better listen. We have no option but to obey. The Holy Spirit of God speaks to churches that are already active in His work. I want you to notice God did not call prayerless men. He called praying men. God did not call idle men. He called serving men. Men that were busy working already, serving the Lord. God did not call fleshly men. He called spiritual men. We would all be wise to ask ourselves, are we in a position that we can hear the Spirit of God if He's trying to speak to us concerning missions? Are we actively engaged in His work? Are we sensitive to His voice? Are we responsive to His instructions? Are we even trying to develop within our children a, a sensitivity that they would listen to the voice of the Lord and we'd encourage them to listen to the voice of the Lord? Missions is not to be just some sideline thing for the church. It is to be the frontline thing and the main thing. It is Christ's commission. It's not something that we just fiddle around with. It's not something that we just, just dedicate just a little bit to. It's something we're to be fully engaged in with our heart, with great passion, with our resources, with our, with our, with our thoughts, with our prayers, with everything we have. It's the heartbeat of God. And it ought to be the heartbeat of the local New Testament church. Number three in your notes, write this, the commencement of missions. Or if you want to write a simpler word, you could write the beginning of missions. The commencement of missions means where does it commence? Where does it begin? So we see the commencement of missions or the beginning of missions. How did the first missionary endeavor move from this willing church and again sanctified hearts and so on, God called men, to the gospel actually being carried to another place? How did it happen? Letter A, it happened with prayer. 
It happened with prayer. Write that in your notes. Letter A, with prayer. Every great work for God begins with prayer. Every great work for God must involve prayer. Before the church sent their missionaries, they were fasting and praying for them. In Acts chapter 13 and verse 3, it says, And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So they were fasting and praying when God spoke and said, Okay, there's some men. I'm calling them. I want you to set them apart for my service. And then we see them fasting and praying some more before they send these men forth. They laid their hands on them not to try to impart some power. That power comes from the Holy Spirit of God. But they laid their hands on them as a sign that they were recognizing God's call upon them. And they were ordaining them. The church wanted to specifically commission them to go from Antioch to the world to preach the gospel. I wonder what a service would have been like that would have been like. These two godly, faithful men in their church, but being sent away. So we see that the work of missions begins with prayer. It begins with prayer. Letter B, it begins with uh, participation. Participation. Letter A, the work of missions begins with prayer. Letter B, the work of missions begins with participation. Participation. Not only did the church fast and pray and recognize God's call on these missionaries, but they, the church members, they sent them. They sent these two men away. It tells us that the church was in great unity in sending the missionaries. The men with all these different backgrounds and various ethnicities that we saw earlier, all of them were focused on obeying the Holy Spirit's call to send these men. It wasn't just the missionaries themselves who were uh, sensitive to, to God's calling. It was the entire church. It was they, it was all of them who, who sent them away. We must all participate in sending missionaries. The world will only hear if missionaries go. And we have the responsibility to send them. Notice what the Bible says in Romans 10, 13 to 15. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they've not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they've not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? The church has to send them. How shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of peace. How specifically did the church at Antioch participate in sending these two men? They supported the men that they sent with prayer and with finances. And both of these were, were, were vital. Both of these were necessary. We've already seen this church's diligence in prayer. It's not a coincidence that in Acts 13, it twice mentions that they were in fasting and prayer, earnest in their fasting and prayer. Prayer is crucial to a missionary having success. Boy, if God brings a missionary to your heart and mind, stop and pray for them. Several times this morning already, my wife and I have prayed for Neil and Beth Ray in China. You ask me why? The only reason I'll tell you why is because God was bringing them to my wife's heart all night long. My wife kept thinking, I don't know what they're going through. I don't know what they face today. But my wife kept thinking about them all night long. So when she got up, she told me that. And she was praying for them. And she said, I've been thinking about them. Maybe God wants me to pray for them. So several times this morning, we've been praying for them. Listen, we, we encourage you to read our missionary letters that we send and pray for them. Read, read those notes and, and pray for them. Watch the videos and, and, and pray for them. They, they need our prayers to, in order to be successful in the ministry. Missionary families face uh, intense spiritual battles. They face intense spiritual warfare that many times we won't understand. And they need us praying for them. Sometimes missionaries, they're just on the very front lines of the battle uh, where Satan will do all he can to hinder them because they're there trying to bring people the gospel of Jesus Christ and we need to be praying for them. Not only that, but many times they're in cultures where maybe Satan has had a, had a grasp on people and he's been blinding the hearts and minds of people and he doesn't like this uh, person, this missionary that's coming and shining the light of the gospel and bringing the truth to them and he wants to do all he can. Satan wants to keep them in his grip. He wants to keep them in the grip of religion. He wants to keep them in the, the grip of their, of their idols or false religion or whatever it may be. Or even just their atheistic agnostic mind. 
And Satan doesn't give up easily. And all how we need to pray. Pray for our missionaries, but also pray for the people they're trying to reach. Paul experienced it firsthand, and he, he, he longed for people to pray for him. Romans 15, 30, he said, uh, Now I beseech you, brethren. Beseech is a very strong pleading type of word. I beseech you. I beg of you. I plead with you. I beseech you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake, and for the love of the Spirit, that ye strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. Paul says, you're striving with me in the ministry when you're praying for me. When you're praying for me. I, you, mean, you, mean, you mean that we can be side by side in the yoke with our missionaries if we're back home praying for them? Yes. Yes. They may be there on the front lines serving the Lord, but you can be in the yoke with them and serving with them and helping them with your prayers to God for them. Ephesians 6, 18 and 19, Paul wrote this, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Notice that he also requested prayer for himself. He says, And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. Paul says, I need you praying for me. 1 Thessalonians 5, 25, brethren, pray for us. 2 Thessalonians 3, 1, finally, brethren, pray for us, that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified, even as it is with you. He says, boy, the word of God has made an impact in your life. It's had free course. It's, it's made a great impact in, in, in Antioch. It's made a great impact in Jerusalem. It's made a great impact where you are. In, 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 uh, in Thessalonica, but he says, pray that as I'm in these other cities and uh, I'm meeting people who've got their false gods and their idols and so on, pray that the word of God would have free course and, and make a powerful impact in the hearts and lives of people. He's pleading with them for their prayers. So more than missionaries just need our financial support, they desperately need the prayers of a church family. A church family. Before William Carey left for the mission field of India, he told those pastors whose churches would be supporting him financially that he was depending on their prayer support even more. One of these men named Andrew Fuller later wrote, We saw that there was a gold mine in India to be had, but it seemed almost as deep as the center of the earth. Who would venture to explore it? Well, I will go down, said Mr. Carey to his brethren, but remember that you must hold the ropes. We solemnly engage to do so, nor while we live shall we desert him. This man, William Fuller, said, okay, William Carey, he's willing to, he's willing to go down. He's willing to, to search for the mine, if you will. He's searching for that treasure in India to try to bring souls to Christ. And we'll be the ones that will hold the ropes as he goes lower and deeper and deeper into that mine, searching for souls, searching for treasure, trying to bring people to Jesus Christ. But we'll hold the ropes for him. Oh, how we need to pray for our missionaries. It can be like holding the ropes for them while they're trying to go deep into enemy territory to try to bring people to the Lord Jesus Christ. We must pray for our missionaries continually. Why do we send out, why do we email some missionary updates a few days now every week? It's so you can remember to pray for them. It's not only the missionaries who need our prayers, it's those waiting in the gospel who also need our prayers. Jesus Christ has directed us to uh, not only pray for souls and so on, but, but really to pray for labors. Pray for labors. In Luke 10, it says, Therefore said he unto them, The harvest truly is great, but the labors are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth labors into his harvest. During the Iranian hostage crisis that took place from November 1979 to January 1981, there was a missionary on furlough that was asked to speak for one minute at a large church. With just one minute to impress on those listening just the need of people and the need of souls around the world, he asked them two questions. He said, how many of you are praying for the 52 Americans that are held hostage in Iran? And nearly every hand went up. And he asked them to lower their hands. And then he said, how many of you are praying for the, at that time, 42 million Iranians that are held hostage to Islam? And nobody raised their hand. And many times, we're all guilty of that. 
You know, in a particular thing, a particular thing, but we'll pray. Something that more closely involves us, oh, we'll pray. But do we think of the need of the world and how people are being held hostage many times by Satan to false religion? And do we pray for their escape? Or do we pray for their rescue? Do we pray that laborers might go and give to them the gospel so they can know Jesus Christ like you know Jesus Christ? You know, we must be just as diligent to pray for the lost and to pray for our missionaries as we are to pray for our, our, just our own friends and loved ones. Participating in missions is not just about the finances as alone, although it includes that. First and foremost, it's about diligent, fervent prayer for our missionaries. Praying for those who are lost without Christ. Praying for our missionaries. In addition to prayer, the church at Antioch sent the missionaries with financial support. It's, it's obvious simply by the fact that they sent them out, but also just through what we see through the New Testament. That as people were reached with the gospel, they were concerned with getting the gospel to others, and they began to financially support missionaries to help them to get the gospel to other places. In God's economy, missions giving is beneficial both to the missionary and to those who give support to the missionary's work. You might say, oh sure, it benefits the missionary. How does it benefit me? The Lord says it benefits you. God's Word says it benefits you. Notice what, notice what Paul wrote to the church at Philippi. He said, not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. The reason I'm writing some things to you is not, not so that you'll send me more gifts, send me more offerings, send me more support. He says, I desire fruit that may abound to your account. Because when you give and when you meet our physical needs, we're going and we're preaching the gospel. And it's going to be fruit to your account in heaven. There'll be rewards for you in heaven because of your giving. He says, but I have all and abound. I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which are sent from you. An odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. Paul pointed out to this church that their giving wasn't for his sake alone. He knew that God would provide for him, but their giving was for their sake also. As they gave to Paul's work in other parts of the world, the spiritual fruit that came as a result was going to be added to their spiritual account. Giving to missions is not only a responsibility of the local church, it is a privilege. Through the opportunity to personally invest in the work of missionaries, we have the ability to reap eternal benefits from their labors. God has chosen to use His church to finance reaching this world with the gospel. We have the privilege of investing in something eternal. When we send missionaries to reach boys and, uh, boys and girls and moms and dads with the gospel, we're laying up treasure in heaven. The Bible teaches us that. that. Where our treasure is, there will our heart be also. And we should be seeking to lay up treasure in heaven. Notice as well what, what, what Paul said to the Philippians. My God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory. He said God will take care of your personal needs because you've been involved in meeting the needs of missions. You know, sometimes we're prone to see giving to missions as a, as a great sacrifice. David Livingston said... How can we at all consider it to be a great sacrifice when we consider Jesus Christ who left heaven, came to earth and died on the cross for us? It's no great sacrifice when compared to the sacrifice of what the Lord Jesus did for us. We're out of time, but just let's look at this in conclusion. What are the responsibilities of every church? Number one, pray for labors. Pray for laborers. Matthew 9 again tells us, Harvest plenteous, laborers few. Pray ye therefore, the Lord of the harvest, they'll send forth laborers into his harvest. We must pray for laborers. Number two, we must go. We must go. When Hudson, while Hudson Taylor, the missionary of China, founder of the China Inland Mission, was visiting Scotland, a school teacher came to him to volunteer to go to China as a missionary. As Hudson Taylor met him, he, he, he saw that this school teacher had one of their legs amputated. Why, said Hudson Taylor, why do you think that, uh, why are you thinking of going as a missionary when you have only one leg? And he said, well, because those with two legs aren't going. Are you willing to go if God was to call you to go? Mark 16, 15, he commands us to go. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So we must pray for labors. We must go. What else? We must send. We must send. Just like the church at Antioch sent men, we must be willing to send. And then fourthly, we must expect God to bless our faith in him. 
expect God to bless our faith in Him. Hebrews 11.6, but without faith it is impossible to please God, to please Him. For he that cometh to God must believe that He is, and that He's a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. The Lord desires that we give to Him, not just with an obligation to duty, but with a heart of love and faith. And God will bless your faith in Him. Missions is the Lord Jesus Christ's direct commission to the local church. It's His direct commission that He's given us, an assignment to believers that we're to reach the world with the gospel. And the work of missions is something that God wants every church and every Christian to be a part of. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd use this message, this lesson from your word to uh, help us to see the, one of the greatest purposes of the local New Testament church. That there's a world that needs the gospel, that needs to be evangelized, and help us to care for the world. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I know